The title for the study this morning is Follow the Master. And our beginning text, our key text, is found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 34. So, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. We see throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ that he was a man of sympathy, he was a man of compassion. It's interesting that first he healed a blind man and then they followed him and not the other way around. As we often think that first people have to follow Christ in order to be blessed. First he blessed them, then they followed him. Let us read about this experience. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, verses 31 to 34. Matthew 20, verses 31 to 34. And the multitude rebuked them, saying, They should hold their peace. Oh, actually, let's start with verse uh, 30. I'm sorry. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. You know, some people thought that Christ only came to those who were the better part of society, those who were not troubling the master, those who were not a burden to him. But Jesus came and he sought specifically the ones who were most needed. And so the people said, um, and as they said, have mercy on, on us, Lord, the multitude rebuked them. But they cried even the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What wilt you that I should do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had what? Compassion, Compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight. And then what happened after that? And then they followed the Master. There are so many examples in the Bible about Christ's compassion for suffering humanity. The widow of Nain, we, we read in Luke chapter 7, verse 13. The widow whose son had died When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. What about the leper? In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 and 41. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. You know, we have examples here of individual persons and people. But he had compassion upon multitudes too. Do you know that multitudes came about him to hear him? Oftentimes, they just left everything. They left their homes. They left their cattle. They left their jobs. They just packed a few things and went to hear the master. And they never thought that they might stay there for two or three days. When in this occasion, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, it says that Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. Because they continued with me now 
Three days. You know what that, what that sounds like? A camp meeting, yes. And have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. You know, these people may not have left thinking that, oh, we're going to spend three days with Jesus. In fact, it was very hard to catch him because he was always moving from town to town. But in this occasion, yes, he did stay three days. So people may have had provision for how long? Maybe for one day. Maybe none. Maybe for two days. But in general, the people were more hungry for the word than for physical food. Yet, Jesus was concerned with their temporal needs. So he had compassion on the multitude. In another occasion, in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, we also read that Christ had compassion. Now listen to this, a little bit different. This one here, it says that Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Why? Was it because they didn't have food for three days? Read on. It's because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So Christ had compassion on them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. Does this sound like the condition of the world today? Yes, it is. The world today is like a, a bunch of sheep without a shepherd. People without direction in life. People who are hungry and thirsty, thirsty for truth, for relief from pain, from suffering, from anxiety. People are seeking for the truth. They're people without a shepherd. And what is our attitude toward them? Toward the much people that are without a shepherd. Are we judgmental toward them? Do we have a better than thou attitude? Like, I know better. Or do we despise their situation? Or do we have compassion like the master did? Let's find the answer by looking at Christ's method. Do we know how to approach a person in need? We find in, this, in scriptures exactly how Christ approached people who had all kinds of needs. Remember how he approached the, the um, Mary Magdalene. Remember how he approached the woman of, of uh, Samaria, the Samaritan woman by the well. Remember how he approached the proud Pharisee, Nic uh, Nicodemus. What would Christ do is the question. So, we may turn people away from the truth and from Christ by our supposed zeal for the truth. Yet, how? Because we don't have tact. We need to learn from Christ and move as he moved and speak as he spoke and refrain from comments when it is not appropriate to do so. What would Christ do? When someone in need comes to the church or even calls us here and say, you know, I'm hungry and my family is hungry. We have, I have a wife and three kids and we just came from North Carolina and uh, I thought I had a job lined up and my job won't start until next week. We're, we are without food. So what do we do? I'm going to see if they know about the Sabbath first, right, before I buy them some groceries. Is that what we do? Oh, I'm going to buy only vegetables and fruit. Because we're going to make them vegetarians, right? No. All right. What, again, the question, what would Christ do? What did Christ do in such situations? Well, we have a statement in the, ministry of, in the book, The Ministry of Healing, Page 143. Remember this page. Ministry of Healing 143. 
This is a classical spirit of prophecy statement. We should know it by heart. Do you know why? Who remembers what is found in Ministry of Healing, page 143? You're not familiar with this text? All right. You will today, and you will never forget it. Here we have a five-step process in leading souls to Christ. How many? How many? Five. five. All right. And when you say five steps, where do we start? Which step? Can we go from one to three? No. Can we go, oh, you know what? I'm going to hurry this up and let's go to number five. I think I can jump all the way to number five. Will that work? No. No. All right. It says right here, pay attention, and you will, we don't have a board to write it down, so, but uh, see if you can remember or write it down. The Savior, I'm going to read the whole statement and we'll come back. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then, listen to the word then, then he bade them follow me. Thank you. I think we're going to have a board. <laughs> All right. So, what was the very first thing that Christ do? He mingled with men. Very good. So Christ mingled with people. Yes. No, we'll find it. Thank you. I think I knew what I was doing when I married my wife some 34 years ago. She's Amen. my assistant here. All right. Somebody will provide some writing instruments. Okay. So let's go, let's go back to number one. Number one is mingling with people. What does mingling with people uh, mean? Means how about making friends first? The Savior mingled with men. That is, the, the key word here is mingling means what? It's a, it's an act, it's a verb to mingle. It's a, it means action. It, it, uh, what kind of action is this? It's, it's, it, it means that we ought to become acquainted with people, to get to know them, and to make friends. That, that's it. Nothing else. Mingle does not mean I want to, you know, I'm going to make you a Sabbath keeper. That is not mingling at all. Mingling or making friends means making friends. Means take a personal interest in the pers in, in, in the individual. And that is it. Don't go beyond. Don't go to step number two, step number three. So we have much learning to do here. Um, I don't want to step in anybody's toes. However, I'm just going to make a comment. When we come to church, very faithfully with our Bible and with our lessons, and we sit and we read and we study, we're punctual and everything. But if I don't mingle, if I, I don't stay for fellowship lunch, or I'm going to sit in my own little corner, or I always sit with my friend, or with my husband, or with my wife, I, that's it. That's it. I, that, that's my custom. That's what I do. Am I making friends? No. no. Right. So what should we do? We should take every opportunity, even within our own family, even within the church, to make friends, to mingle with people. Don't think, if you see me and my wife not sitting together at potluck, that we had a fight. That's not the case. It's just that she says, well, I haven't talked to so-and-so uh, uh, in a while, so I think I'm going to sit with them this time. 
And I say, fine, but I feel like I haven't talked to OJ or to Brother Joe or to Brother Ben or, or Brother Maurice. So I think I'm going to sit at their table today. Okay? So um, we need to take opportunities to make friends, to see how people feel, what's going on, how was your week, did you have a hard time? <coughs> Do we care? <coughs> we have to care for each other. So that is, number one is what, what is it? Mixing. Mixing. How about, I'm going to say friendship, okay? Yeah, because mingling, sometimes the word could be mis, mis, misunderstood. But, okay, so Christ, Christ's method. First one is friendship, mingle, be social. Okay. Oh, by the way, where is this found again? What book? Huh? Okay, very good. I think some 30 years ago when I went to missionary school, if I didn't remember where that was and couldn't say it by heart, I would have failed the class. That was how critical that was, because we learned Christ's method. Okay, so after mingling, after making friends, what's step number two? It says that he showed his sympathy for them. Show sympathy. Okay, so number two is to show sympathy. Exactly. Or does that mean to criticize? Ah. You know, if somebody, if somebody comes to you and says like this, I've got a smoking habit. What should be our answer? Should our answer be like this? Hmm. Okay, somebody comes to you and says, I'm struggling with cigarettes, smoking. Well, they are only saying that because you already made friends. Okay? Nobody will share those things if it, they don't think you're, you're their friend. Right? Okay. Now, now they, they, they share a struggle. It may not be cigarettes. It may be something else. But, all right. Let's say, I'm struggling with sm cigarette smoking. Is your answer going to be, I don't smoke. I would never touch such a thing. That stuff. Don't you know that that cigarette smoking kills? You're going to die. Is that what our answer is? Going to be. But you know, I think sometimes we are like that. I don't, Christ never answered like that. Christ never spoke like that. that, does, that does that mean he agreed with smoking? No. no. Okay. So, such statements only discourage the person. Christ was a... What did he have for people? Compassion. He, wa he, he was compassionate towards people. So how about if we say something else, like, something like this. It must be very hard for you. I, I understand what you're going through because I also had a struggle in my life. It may not have been smoking, but I had a struggle. And uh, sure, it might be a different area. And then we can say, and by the grace of God, I overcame. No, don't go, don't go and say yet how you did it. Okay? Just show, what is it? Show, what is it? Sympathy. Sympathy. Hope. 
Give, say something that will give them hope, but don't give them the answer yet. You're still showing sympathy. There's some, a couple more steps before you can tell them, oh, you know what? There is a five-day stop smoking program. I'm going to sign you up. <laughs> don't do that yet. That's step number five. All right? OK, you ready for number three? OK, then the next thing that it says here in the Spirit of Prophecy is that he ministered to their needs. Okay, so number three. Minister. Um, I actually, let's, let's put that in one word, okay? And the word, I'm going to let you fill in. He ministered to their needs. And we're going to look for one word that indicates that. What is that word? Kindness. Kindness. Because sympathy and kindness are not the same thing. Do you see how we're moving from sympathy is like, I'm really sorry for what you're going through. But kindness involves what? Action. Okay? Right. Sympathy and comfort are pretty similar. Yeah, because it's words. But kindness involves, I'm going to show, when someone shows kindness means, here's a glass of water. Here is something. Let me help you. I'm going to call you to encourage you. Can I take you to the doctor? Can I be, can I meet you? Can I, you know, it's something that I must do. Okay? So kindness means action. All right. And um, so Christ, Christ did not say like this to the multitude. If you promise to follow me, I'm going to feed you. He never said that to anybody. He took care of their needs. He um, first healed, then he told them, follow me or go and sin no more. I'd like to uh, share some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is found in Review and Herald, January 18, 1912. The sympathy Christ expressed for the physical needs of his hearers won from many a response to the truths he sought to teach. Actually, this, this more refers over here. So, what won a response for them to hear the truth? Was first showing sympathy. And... Um, the next one is from Councils to Parents, Teachers, and Students, 485. To every student who is seeking a medical education, I would say, look beyond the present. Turn away from the transitory things of this life, from selfish pursuits and gratifications. For what purpose are you seeking an education? This has nothing to do with medical school only. It's to do with any pursuit in life. Why are you seeking an education? A question. Is it not that you may relieve suffering humanity? Question. You know, why is it that we do things? Why, yeah, uh, especially, like I said, pursuing a career in life. Is it always that I may make good money? Let's look up in the Wall Street Journal to see which are the most promising professions in this day, so that we can make the most money, so that we can what? Enjoy life? 
and be miserable. <laughs> or, as it says here, look beyond the present. That's what it says. Turn away from the transitory things of this life, from the selfish pursuits and gratifications. What is the purpose? Is it to relieve suffering humanity? So you can't present the truth to someone who is hungry or someone who has some deep sorrow or pain or special needs. Okay, and number four. He won their confidence. Four. So Christ won their confidence. This is very important because if I don't have the confidence of my friend, someone I'm trying to help, they're not going to share their deep sorrow. They're not going to trust what I have to say. This is very important. As I was preparing this study, as I was working on it last night, I had the, uh, there was a bang, bong, bang, whatever, an ind indication that an email popped up. Right? And, uh, you know, we're curious people, so I clicked over there to see who, who, what it was, who it was. And it just happened that it matched this. I'm going to read it. Here is what the email says. Hi, please, could you help me? Question mark. I need someone I can trust. And who can help me? to raise up higher. Someone out there who I don't know just happened to got my email address. Someone who I could tell very clearly by the name and uh, I had and the English that is a foreign person from a foreign country. and uh, who I may never see face to face. Someone who needs help. But they want somebody who? I need someone I can trust. And who can help me to raise up? I immediately responded. I said, yes. I didn't say you can trust me. I said like this. And my wife, I shared with my wife. Um, I said, I can lead you to the one, one I put in capital words, you know, to the one we all can trust, to the one who, who can help us. And, there is, and then, by the way, where are you? Where are you? Where are you from? Where are you located? I'm in London, England. You know. So thank God for the internet. You can very, very quickly and uh, exchanged already a few, a few uh, um, uh, words. And this was like 10 o'clock at night in London was what? What is it, five hours or six? Six. Six? That was like four in the morning. So what are you doing up? He says, I can't sleep. Wow. But I quickly quoted some Bible verse, gave some encouraging words, and trust in the Lord. And uh, today... <laughs> I was back in the office there, and there was an email. Thank you for your words. You were a great encouragement. I was able to go to sleep in peace. And, and, then, and then I said, Pray, you know, praise the Lord, and then we'll continue talking. So uh, there are people out there who are looking for what? Yes, but before they can have confidence, what do they need? Kind. You have to be kind. You have to show you giving your time you, that you're willing to give your time and attention. But before you can do that, you have to show what? You have to show sympathy. But before that, you have to be their friend. You have to show friendliness and not condemnation. Okay? We're going to go now to 
Well, uh, let, let, I'd like to read some uh, statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. From Adventist Home 192, it says, Give some of your leisure hours to your children. Associate with them in their work and in their sports and win their confidence. Cultivate their friendship. So what do you have to do before you win their confidence? Parents? Parents, parents to be, grandparents, uncles and aunts. Huh? Just just what? Like teaching them and correcting them and huh? Give some of your leisure hours to your children. Associate associate with them in their how about it says here, you know, you know what it says here? Associate with them in their work and in their sports. And win their confidence. Okay? Their work, maybe school work. I, I don't know. Okay. So, something else about children. In uh, Christian education, page 222. The youth are the subjects of Christ's special... Uh, uh, of, sorry. The youth are the, sub, the objects of Satan's special attack. But kindness, courtesy... The tender sympathy that flows from a heart filled with love to Jesus will give you access to them. What is it? Kindness and courtesy and sympathy, all the things that we've been studying, kind, all of this, okay? Will um, give you access to them. You may win their confidence so that they will listen to your words and thus be saved from many a snare of the enemy. And in Desire of Ages, page 517, as you win their confidence in you, as followers of Christ, you can't, you don't, there's, you don't even want people to have confidence in you unless we're following Christ. Because you don't want blind following the blind. But only as, we see, you can trust the Apostle Paul so long as he is following Jesus. Right? Right. So as, as you win their confidence in you, as you follow your follower of Christ, it will be easy to teach them of the great love wherewith he has loved us. So now, this already gave the clue. What's number five? It will be easy to do what? To teach them of the great love wherewith with he has loved us. So what does what does the number five lead lead us to? Number five. Well, Jesus said, "Follow me," but that's actually teaching. Follow Christ. Again, this has this means this is an action. Verb, to follow, to teach, to follow. This is where you tell them about the Sabbath, about vegetarianism, about come to church, about whatever else needs to be told. That's it. Only after you have one, two, three, four, then. If we've gone through those steps, then we go ahead to number five. In Acts of the Apostles, page 18, it says that wherever hearts were open to receive the divine message, he unfolded the truths of the way of salvation. When did he unfold the truths of salvation? When? When hearts were open to receive the divine message. And you know how hearts are open? Hearts are open when we follow all these steps. General Conference Bulletin, April 8, 1901, says, Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow the Master. You can never give Him as much as He has given you. He gave His life for you. What have you given for Him? And I leave you um, with this question. Are you ready to follow the Master today? 
Amen. Amen. Father, we bow before your throne of grace with thankful hearts for the, the great love you have toward us that you gave your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary to save us from our sins. We thank you that Jesus is our friend and that he is today pleading uh, with his blood, saying, my blood, my blood, and pleading for on our behalf uh, with, uh, with the Father in the courts above. We pray that, uh, Lord, that we may take uh, serious our relationship with, with uh, Jesus and that we may um, understand and that uh, we are now in the Day of Atonement and uh, probation will soon close. Help us to uh, de rededicate our lives to you and to serve you fully and also to serve our fellow man. Help us to represent Christ in all that we do and say and to show his love and care and compassion and sympathy and kindness and tenderness so that as we point um, others to Jesus that they may follow you. And we pray that uh, you would bless each one here today and you may, Lord, uh, you know each heart and uh, needs and, and fill the needs of the soul and and heal the the any uh, diseases of the body and uh, and also encourage those who might be discouraged and help us to be faithful until the end. We pray dismiss us now with your love and care in the name of Jesus. Amen.